George H.W. Bush. Here's Lester Holt. Good afternoon, everyone. We're back on the air to bring you our coverage of the final leg of President George H.W. Bush's final journey. The casket bearing the president's body has arrived or is, is arriving right now as we watch in this live picture at uh, College Station, Texas, home of the George Bush Presidential Library, where a short time from now, the 41st president will be laid to rest in a private ceremony. The train left Houston this morning after a funeral service at St. Martin's Episcopal Church that included a eulogy by the president's close friend, former Secretary of State James Baker, who, as you see here, dinner once in a while, just one of them at a time. 43. The casket was brought aboard the special train known as 4141, which then carried the president and his family on the two and a half hour journey to College Station, slowing down through small towns along the way as people came out in a light rain to pay their respects. NBC's Ron Allen is in College Station, whereas again, uh, the train is uh, pulling in here momentarily. Ron? Lester, I can hear the train coming. I can hear the whistle coming. It's a very somber boot out here. There have been people standing, though, for hours and hours, and it was a driving rain and a very chilly air waiting for the arrival of President Bush, the casket, and the family. You can see behind me over there, along the tracks, there are literally hundreds, thousands of people several deep and as far as the eye can see down lining the route this of course is the home of the president's library but also the graduate school of government and public service named for him emphasis on public service that we understand is one of the main reasons that the president chose this place for his library because of the history of public service here, the history of sending students and graduates off to join the military. There is still a significant military component to the school now, one of the largest schools in the country, Texas A&M. Uh, there's an honor guard here. There's also the marching band here that will play. So while this is somewhat somber, there's also going to be a celebration of the president's life. Uh, we understand we're going to hear from the marching band, the, the Aggie war hymn, the fight song that you probably hear more often at football games when it's again, it's something that President Bush insisted on hearing this day. Uh, the train is going to come in this way. It should be here any moment. We'll hear some remarks. There are several dozen honorary pallbearers. They are, for the most part, uh, officials past and present from the university, from the library, from the Bush School. Again, all about public service here. And remember, we're also just some 90 miles from Houston, another reason President Bush chose to put his library, establish his library here. From here, there's a hearse waiting here. The casket will be taken from here about five minutes away, a five minute drive down George Bush Drive, up to the library grounds for burial on a hill, on a side of a hill we understand that's uh, along a creek and surrounded by oak trees, a place, that, of course, that, that President Bush selected with his wife and his daughter. And uh, the, the pictures you saw a moment ago, people lining the, the route uh, as captured by cameras on this special train, just a remarkable outpouring. If the nation said goodbye with the state funeral yesterday, in many ways today is about Texas saying goodbye to the late president. My colleague Tom Brokaw is with me for the coverage. Tom, Texas A&M uh, holds a special place in the hearts of the Bushes. Well, a lot of people were surprised when he went there because he didn't have a prior connection. But it's a remarkable school, you know. People think of it in a military sense, but it has a very strong sciences department, for example, great education department, medical department as well. And they welcomed him with open arms. I thought, if for no other reason, I would want to be buried there because it's the alma mater of Lyle Lovett. I mean, how much more can you ask in life than to be associated with Lyle Lovett? And the school will be elevated by his presence there because it's not UT, it's not Rice or Baylor or one of the others, but the president putting his, putting effect, not just his remains there, but the presidential library as well, will make it a center for conferences about national patriotism and about government and other things. You know, as well as anyone, about the 12th man tradition that they have. That's the student body during a football game. That's their 12th man. That's what elevates the football team on the field. And George Bush will be, you know, in his own way, the 13th man for Texas A&M. He'll bring to that school a great new, renewed sense of spirit and pride in what they're doing. And I, I want to just say one sure. thing about Texas and A&M this year. They get President Bush as a permanent resident in the library. And this year, in football, they defeated LSU. I don't know whether you're aware of this or not. 74 to 72 
in seven overtimes. It was a record. So AM is having a great year at this point. They get to welcome a president to their grounds, and at the same time, they knocked off LSU 74-72. And, and quite a turnout there. A number of uh, VIP school officials will be there to greet uh, the family and greet the casket as it arrives aboard that train in a moment ago. Uh, you may have seen some of the wider shots of the train. It is painted uh, to, to uh, along the same theme as, as Air Force One, that distinctive uh, those t shades of blue and gold. Um, but it is uh, been about a two and a half hour dry a ride from Houston, and uh, scenes like this have been captured along the way. People standing out, and what we're told is a 50 ish, uh, but a feeling colder on a, on a drizzly day in that part of Texas. Uh, some people saluting, some with their hands over their hearts, some simply waving, uh, spending their greetings not only to the late president, but uh, the Bush family, which of course, uh, and the extended family, riding aboard that train. Uh, this has been a very, this has been a very uh, uh, public series of events we've witnessed over the last several days. But of course, the final act will be in private, a, a private ceremony, as uh, President Bush, 41, is is interred into his uh, final resting place alongside his wife and daughter. Let's bring in uh, Kelly O'Donnell with us. Kelly was uh, outside the church today for uh, another emotional service, and, uh, and joins us with more now, Kelly. It has been uh, days of really rich in emotion and memory and also trying to send a message. Clearly the Bush family and the former president himself, who was so much a part of the planning of these days of remembrance, wanted to tell a story over the sweep of this week about his life, about his service, about his family. Americans always feel a strong connection to first families. That's typically been a part of our culture. And with the Bush family, it has been uh, certainly enlarged by the fact that you have a father and son who rose to the office of uh, the United States' uh, highest office, the presidency, and of course, uh, two governors in Jeb Bush and George W. Bush, and now a third generation in George Prescott Bush, who eulogized his grandfather here today, who is holding statewide office as the Texas Land Commissioner. So we have seen uh, really a kind of a, an array of different messages being reunited with this family, honoring his service, remembering his life, and today, laying him to rest and you're That's seeing and, and kelly thank you and you're basically seeing the view the bush family has had along this route of, of the people who have lined the uh, the route in this case is a bit more crowded now as they pull into uh, college station where the casket uh, will be received and there will be an arrival ceremony and there it is you can see it now pulling uh, into view as the uh, many of the texas a m uh, officials are there to to greet uh the president the uh, library opened on that campus in uh, 1997, and uh, the former president was a frequent visitor, along with uh, Barbara Bush, to uh, sporting events there. They would show up at, at games from time, and time to time, and we're told all the teams there, uh, a and uh, teams, would be wearing a helmet decal um, or uniform patches honoring uh, Bush 41. It's going to be first worn, uh, this patch or this emblem, by the men's and women's basketball teams during their games. Uh, it was approved uh, by the family. Essentially, it's based on the shield from the official President Bush 41 logo, and it will be in the school's colors of maroon and white. And look at that crowd outside Kyle Field there, just getting a, a, a glimpse of the train. Ron, you've got a good view of it coming in now? We can almost see it, Lester. It's coming around the bend there. I can see the lights now, and um, the honor guard has snapped to attention, and uh, yes, uh, we can now see it. I can see the lights coming through the trees there, um, and the crowd, some waving, some saluting, many for the most part with their hands in the air, paying their respects to to the president and and his, and his family. It's 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 quite a quite a moment, um, and it reminds you of how important President Bush is to this community, to this state. Uh, this is, of course, um, uh, he's been, his library and school have been here for about 20 years, and many people have stories about him popping into classrooms, popping into practice, and you can kind of st imagine that in his kind of awkward, gangly way. Um, but he's uh, quite, been quite a presence here. There have been world leaders here as well, uh, but he's been here, and this, of course, will be a, a very important part of his legacy. The students, the graduates who leave here, the lessons, the lectures that are taught here, the ideas, the values, and of course it is mostly about the idea of service.
Yeah, watching the yeah, train are. move yeah, in, and, it, and as we watch it, uh, it's worth noting we're in an era of um, short attention spans for, for major events. We tend to move on to the next thing and the next day. We have been mourning uh, this president uh, since the news of his death uh, Friday night, and uh, it, it's in many ways, Tom, I think it's given the country you know, time to ruminate and reflect on where we've been, where we're going, and, and to, to really stand back and look at the man and the presidency. I hope that there will be a long half-life for this past week. I think it's caused people to reflect on it. I know it's been the subject of breakfast across America, where men gather to sort things out, where women are deciding about what their role ought to be in America these days. And I would hope as well that every member of Congress and the Senate will be looking at this honorable man and how he was treated at the end of his life as a result of his honorable service. Whatever else they thought of his politics, they always thought he brought the best of humankind to the job. He was not a man who wanted to put himself first. It was always the country first. You know, there were tough campaigns against Michael Dukakis and others, but at the same time, overall, he served in so many senior capacities with distinction, and it was not about him. It was about his obligation as a citizen. Whether that will last, Buster, I can't say in this time of social media and everybody slamming everybody back and forth, but I would hope that we would have something akin to that coming out of this. It, it, it has been a, it's been a very special week in, in so many ways to watch. This is a still photograph that was just provided to us of the president's casket on board that train, 4141, the Union Pacific train, um, one of the honor guards there. Uh, and that casket in, in shortly will be uh, brought off the train and uh, placed back in the hearse for the ride uh, uh, to the library and ultimately to the, to the burial. Uh, let me bring in, as we, uh, as we await the uh, arrival ceremony to get underway, I want to bring in our, some of our guests standing by in Washington, Andy Card, who's been with us uh, for much of this, was Transportation Secretary to Bush 41, Chief of Staff to Bush 43. Anita McBride was an assistant to President George W. Bush and Chief of Staff to Laura Bush. And our presidential historian, Michael Beschloss, is with us. Uh, Michael, let me just go to you very quickly. Um, this, this final chapter of this, of this long goodbye, uh, different presidents have done it different ways, uh, but there is some historical significance to uh, the train. Uh, there is, and remember always that when a president uh, has his final journey, unless his end happens suddenly, he has either approved or designed every step of the way. And so it was George H.W. Bush's idea that you would have this train from Houston to uh, College Station. And he was a big reader of history. He certainly knew that Abraham Lincoln, after his death, had been born back to Springfield, Illinois, on a long train ride that took almost two weeks, FDR in 1945. And maybe most of all for George H.W. Bush, Dwight Eisenhower, who was a hero of his, a president he knew who served at the same time his father, Prescott Bush, served in the Senate. And you know, the other thing, Lester, is that we're also seeing a fairly new tradition which is presidents being buried right next to their presidential libraries. That started with FDR, who built the first presidential library in the early 1940s, and virtually every president from then on you will find in the garden of their library, uh, except for John Kennedy, of course, at Arlington, and Lyndon Johnson, who's buried on the LBJ Ranch. And Bush 43 has just exited the train alongside uh, a familiar face now. We've seen uh, escorting him the entire, uh, over the last several days, Major General Michael Howard. Uh, he's the commanding general of the Joint Force Headquarters of the National Capital Region. For the U.S. Army Military District of Washington, essentially uh, those are the folks among their many duties are ceremonial uh, moments like this. And uh, uh, the Major General has... Uh, been the official escort of the of the Bush family through this and will until the end of, of these proceedings and, and ceremonial moments. But there's the family now gathered uh, just off the train, uh, obviously awaiting the uh, casket to be offloaded. As we watch it, let me bring in uh, Andy Card. Andy, I don't know if you've been in touch uh, with with Bush 43 over these last several days, but I was watching him in the in both funerals and obviously. Uh, you know, sad, but obviously he, he also seemed to be embracing his friends and, and some of the remembrances. And and can, can you give a sense of what do you think his state of mind has been? 
Well, I think that he recognizes now that he has been handed the baton of responsibility to kind of be the patriarch of the family. And he understands that. He will do it well. He has the greatest respect for his father. And he also has the love that his father gave to him that he will give to all of his siblings and the nieces and nephews and grandchildren. And you know, it's a, such a family of love. And I think that's what you'll find that President George W. Bush will carry on the way his father did. And Laura Bush will play that role as, as well. They're, the entire family is a remarkable family. And the president is being, President Bush 41, is being laid to rest. He will be in a state of peace on the campus at Texas A&M, where his legacy in written form or photographs and the museum is inside the library. And then the living legacy will be at the Bush School, on the same campus overlooking his site of burial. And that's where the future of America will be trained, and they'll be trained uh, as if George Bush is training them with courage, respect, duty, and honor. The uh, family gathering as we listen to the amazing prelude by the singing cadets in the Fighting Texas Aggie Band. Let us listen. I'm not sure what is especially touching about the scene that we're seeing that family. They have roots in both ends of the country. You know, they're deeply rooted in New England still. The president would go back to Walker's Point, Maine, every summer and spend time there. He was comfortable there. His son went to Yale, and then they moved to Texas. But they keep the connection back and forth. So you can't place them in just one or the other. They really reflect a kind of dual state and a dual culture attachment in America. And I find that uh, not just inspirational, but heartening as well, that they can feel connected to the various parts. They're not just logged into one or the other. And here is uh, the late president. 